Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for this event. I'm Roberta Eiley. I'm the Head of Regenerative Design here at the RSA. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all and our three fantastic speakers to the event tonight, uh, exploring the following questions. So um, what would it take for our systems of education to really equip our young people with the future-proof capabilities and mindsets uh, they need to lead flourishing lives uh, on a flourishing planet for the century ahead? Uh, it feels very appropriate that we're tuning into this um, from the RSA, the Royal Society of Arts, Manufacture and Commerce, which over the years has uh, contributed to, to various shifts in education, from experimenting with the first ever uh, public examinations back in 1850s, uh, and later with the first ever technical e examinations as well. And of course, there's lots to be proud of in our education system. And I was reminded of that actually listening to an interview with Malala this morning. Um, but of course, we know that our education system really doesn't work for a lot of people. And uh, the way we're living and working is certainly not working for our planet either. So rethinking um, what the future of education and learning looks like is really key. And is part certainly of um, what we're keen to explore at the RSA in terms of our new mission um, in contributing to a resilient, regenerative and rebalanced future. So this conversation is um, part of exploring our inquiry here at the RSA around the capabilities we need to shift towards a more regenerative economy and ultimately a more regenerative world. Uh, and I'm really thrilled that today we've got three speakers um, who are the absolute sort of lantern bearers really here um, with us these, uh, this evening, uh, each of whom is really showing what's possible in terms of how we can shift our education and learning systems. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce um, Satish Kumar, Rachel Musson and Ben Rawlance. Uh, hello to you all and welcome. Uh, I could spend um, many hours with each of these um, great speakers, so uh, we're going to have to keep it fairly pacey tonight and just accept that this is going to be the beginning of a conversation or the continuation of a conversation that will carry on beyond today. Um, I'm going to introduce each of them fairly quickly, um, but I know the team here will be sharing various links and resources in the chat box if you want to find out more. Um, so first with Satish, um, I mean, what to say? <laughs> He's uh, been quietly kind of setting the global agenda for change, really, for the last 50 years. Uh, I think it was uh, 40 years ago, was it, that you set up the small school? Um, 30 years ago that you set up Schumacher College in Devon. And actually it was um, that anniversary, I think, of Schumacher College that prompted the publication uh, of his, uh, Satish's latest book, which as you can tell, <laughs> has somewhat been foundational in my thinking uh, and is about all about regenerative learning, bringing together essays from people across um, this space. Um, and it's really set the inspiration for this event. So thank you, Satish. Um, also with us today um, are two regenerative educators. So we have Rachel Musson, um, who founded Thoughtbox in 2015, uh, a not-for-profit not social enterprise uh, dedicated to regenerating education. And I think it's just passed the milestone of having more than 5,000 members worldwide, which is great. Uh, and Rachel brings to this a real background from her experience, I think, was it as an English teacher um, back in the day, <laughs> uh, and really wanting to play that role in shifting how our education systems work, and has actually produced her own ebook on regenerative education in schools, which I think you can find on her on the Thoughtbox website. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, we have Ben Rawlance with us. Ben is also a writer, uh, and most recently uh, published his book, um, The Tree Line. Um, but perhaps most relevantly for today, he's also the founder and CEO of Black Mountains College, uh, which is an experimental educational institution in Wales, in the beautiful Brecon Beacons, uh, and uh, which is really dedicated to creating a different kind of future where nature and humans thrive together. So it's brilliant to have each of you with us. And uh, just a reminder that as we kick off our conversation, uh, we will have time in the second half of the session to um, address key questions that are coming up. So feel free to, to post questions in the Q&A box as we go, or indeed actually comments and reactions. Those are very welcome too. It's nice to have a bit of uh, interaction as we go along and I'll pick up on those uh, as best I can. Uh, and anything we don't get to um, will shape our thinking for future events. So it's never lost. Um, and then to kick us off, I'm gonna invite Satish um, to, to provide a few opening remarks, if I may. 
Um, for someone who's been at the forefront of this space for so long, I suppose it'd be great just for you to set the scene for us. Um, you know, why is it so important that we shift to a regenerative model of education? And why is it so important that we focus on that now? Thank you for your warm introduction. And uh, it is a great pleasure to uh, be um, in this session. Regenerative learning and this book we published to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Schumacher College. And uh, we had a, a sort of essay competition and we got so many wonderful submissions that apart from three winning essays, we thought that these essays should be brought together in a book. And so um, we feel at Schumacher College, and I personally feel that our education system is neither serving humanity nor serving the planet Earth. When our students go to a university or a school, teachers look at the student and they think that the student has no body. It has no hands, no heart, no soul, no spirit, only brain, only half brain, because we have two hemispheres of the brain, left hemisphere, which is more rational, more logical, more scientific, more me measured, more administrative, and the right hemisphere of the brain, which is more intuitive, more imaginative, more creative, more poetic, our university, the schools mainly address and educate the left hemisphere of the brain. Schumacher College was established to educate the whole person. Education of head, of course, we value intellectual knowledge, scientific knowledge, no, no problem, but also education of right hemisphere of the brain, education of the heart, how we respect each other, how we love each other, how we be compassionate, how we relate to each other and to our planet Earth. And our education of hands, how we transform ordinary clay into beautiful pottery, ordinary wood into beautiful furniture, ordinary into extraordinary, painting, um, making something. Humans are makers, not simply consumers. So education of head, education of heart, education of hands. This is the idea of regenerative education. And our education at Schumacher College, and this is the book ad advocating, should be nature-centered, earth-centered, rather than just job-centered. At the moment, our education is preparing and training young people to go out and exploit nature. Nature is simply a means to an end. And the end is economic growth. So at the service of economic growth, we are educating our young people to go out and use nature for economic growth. I think this is a dangerous idea behind education. And this is why we are getting uh, global warming, climate change, Biodiversity diminishing, our pollutions are, our pollution is widespread. Our oceans are full of plastic. Our rivers are full of sewage. Our rainforests are being destroyed. Animals are being treated in factory farms in a very cruel way. So our education has to change and make ec ecology or nature not as a means to an end, but integrity of nature should be the end. And all our economy, production, consumption, our profit, business, industry, all should be in the service of the planet Earth and in the service of the dignity of human beings. So humanity, even human beings are treated as a resource for the economy. All our businesses, business houses, governments, industry, they all have HR department. HR stands for human resources. So humans are a resource for making money, making profit, 
running organization. I don't know what RSA has. I hope RSA doesn't have HR for human resources. For me, HR should stand not for human resources, but HR should stand for human relationship. So please transform HR from human resources to human relationship. Humans are not a resource for making money and economic growth, but economic growth should be in the service of human well-being and planetary well-being. I was invited to speak at the London School of Economics and I challenged the London School of Economics and I said, please change your name. Call it LSEE, -E, London School of e Economy, but also Ecology, Ecology and Economy. Without Ecology, Economy can be dangerous because Ecology means knowledge of our planet home and Economy means management of our planet home. You don't teach the knowledge of our planet home, but you teach them how to manage it. Please tell me, how are you going to manage something that you don't know? I'm sorry to say that LSE did not take up my challenge and they have not changed their name. And not only LSE, but all our universities, Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale, big, big universities, they are preparing and educating and training young people, almost brainwashing them to go and exploit nature extractive economy. And so our education is responsible for our climate change. Our universities are responsible for our global warming. Our educated people are responsible for all the pollution and the waste and the ocean with plastic and rivers with sewage and, uh, and our rainforest being destroyed. All that is responsible for all the, these things are being run by highly educated people highly educated, the biggest universities of the world, most famous universities of the world, like Oxford, like Cambridge, like Harvard, like LSE, like Yale, and many, many other universities in Paris, Mumbai, Beijing, Moscow, wherever you are, California, wherever you are. So I think unless we change our education and see nature not only as a resource for the economy, but nature as a source of life itself, we are going into a bleak future. Global warming, climate change, nature, um, nature conservation and preservation is not going to be solved by new technology or just windmills and solar panels. We have to change our worldview. We have to change our mindset and think that economy should be in the service of ecology of planet Earth. Economy and ecology should go together. So this is the theme of the regenerative uh, learning and, and, and the book is there and many, many wonderful essays. So I would urge our uh, listeners in this conference to acquire a copy of this book and read and, and join the movement um, for transforming education and, and, and creating education, which is regenerative rather than extractive. So with these few words, I would like to open the discussion and thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you, Satish. I knew you'd set the tone for this discussion, so thank you. Um, this is a good point then to be turning our attention to what this actually looks like. You know, when we say regenerative education and we set out that new purpose, what does it look like in reality? And I'd love to bring in Rachel in the first instance with your work um, with Thoughtbox. I think actually in, in the book, Satish, you have a couple of essays written from the point of view of the future in 100 years time. And I kind of hope we don't have to wait that long. <laughs> But perhaps, Rachel, if you are putting yourself in the, in the shoes of the future, as it were, how different would our schools actually look if we were really delivering on the vision that Satish set out there? You know, what, what, how different would the curriculum look like? How different would the culture in the school? Um, perhaps you can start painting that picture for us. Mm -hmm. There's I've just the quotes come to mind when Satish was talking, and I actually have just found it right here from E.F. Schumacher, which is the foundation of Schumacher College. And he said, the volume of education continues to increase and yet so does pollution, exhaustion of resources and the dangers of ecological collapse. 
if yet more education is to save us, it has to be an education of a different kind, an education that takes us right into the depths of things. And I feel that is so much of where we're at. You know, education has the power to change the world. And yet at the moment, the education system is contributing to so much of the of the catastrophes that we're facing, not consciously. And I, I, I always speak on the behalf of the educator. What is happening in our schools is not the fault of the teacher. It's not the fault of the child. It's not the fault of the policymaker. It's the fault of the, system, the, the design of the system. So we need a new design. But when we think about what the future of education could look like, um, there's a question I like to ask a lot, which is probably a little bit of an inconvenient question, but it's what is the point of school? Um, what is the point and what are we doing with our education systems? Surely the point of school is to prepare young people to um, care for themselves, each other and the planet. Because if that is the foundation of a learning environment, really everything else can flourish from there. And so that is the question that I hold in the inquiry and in the support that we um, that we work with in schools. You know, how can we bring a culture of care to the foundation of your school? care for self, care for others, care for the planet. And it's as simple as two words. And, and I'm a, an eternal optimist, so I say it's simple, which clearly it's a, it's, it's a little bit more complex than my, uh, than my language. But there's two words that I really hold in this space, enabling and allowing. When we start to think about the qualities that we really need, the competencies, these competencies of systems thinking, of critical thinking, of compassion, of kindness, of care, these are innate qualities in children. Children are natural born systems thinkers. Children are naturally um, tuned into their ecological self. They're tuned into fascination with the natural world, fascination with the world around them. And actually, if we just enable and allow what is very innate in our children to flourish, we've already got a foundation for a healthy system. So it's so much a kind of question of what can we enable and allow and what do we need to take out that's getting in the way of that, that flourishing? And we know that examinations for a competitive market are not supporting anybody to flourish. We know that um, decompartmentalizing the curriculum so that we segregate learning into topics it doesn't make sense because that's not how the world works. We know that putting children into high pressured um, situations day after day is, is, is causing so much of the um, ill health, the mental ill health for young people. And also sitting down indoors for the majority of your childhood is not good for spirit, soul, body or mind. Um, and there's a there's a miserable report that um, UK school children um, have less time outside than maximum security prisoners. Um, so there's a there's a sort of terrifying factor taking with us. Um, so there's a lot of space uh, for shift and there's, there's for better or worse, there's a lot of um, welcome for shift because the system is really struggling to sustain itself right now. And teachers are having to firefight symptoms of a, a world in crisis and so let's uh, really open up this space for doing things differently and that shift into a different mindset is I think a very um, exciting space. Thank you Rachel and maybe just one follow-up question quickly um, I, I saw a question in the Q&A box um, you know often I suppose alternative models of education crop up in you know alternative schools you often have to pay for that you know and I guess I'm sat here wondering you know what are you seeing almost in the mainstream school sector are you seeing schools taking steps in the right direction what does that look like? Yes and, and the work that we do in Thoughtbox is very much with mainstream schools within existing mainstream systems and, and really spotlighting those teachers who were feeling brave enough to do things differently, whether that's just in the way that they turn up in the classroom, whether that's um, models or examples of learning happening in the school, or whether that's an entire school system kind of doing things differently. Um, and so I, I, I know Myra's going to share this, but I've just released a free ebook um, looking at a lot of these learning models happening right across the world. And Satish and Ben's um, models of learning are also in here as well, so that we can start to give teachers the confidence and the courage to try things out. Um, when we start to think about the education system, it can feel really overwhelming. Um, and yet the system is us. We are the system. So what can we start to shift by shifting the way that we show up? And so very, um, we need the pioneers. We need alternative education systems like Schumacher, like Black Mountains College. But we also need to support those in the system with the confidence and the courage and the capacity to start making the change um, as they go. So that's that's really, it's energizing to see what is already happening. 
That's great. Thank you, Rachel. I'm sure we'll come back to that as we get into some of the other questions coming up in the Q&A as well. Um, ben, I'd love to bring you in at this point um, to share your experience with Black Mountains College. I mean, it's picking up all over the place. You must be thrilled I'm seeing coverage of it in The Guardian, in New Statesman, um, everywhere. And it's clear that there's a lot of interest in the kind of model of education that you're um, profiling. I'd love to hear from you a bit about that, but also, you know, in what ways you feel like Black Mountains College is meeting a kind of key need right now and, you know, how students are seeing um, themselves and their futures and how, uh, how I suppose, also um, employers, from the perspective of employers, what they're looking for from graduates um, coming from places like BMC. Um, so let's start from there. Uh, I'd love to hear from you, Ben. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, a real honour to be joining uh, Rachel and Satish. Um, I I think I'd love to, to to come back to the question about, um, and I'll perhaps I'll finish there if I've got if I say a couple of things more broadly. But I'd like to come back to the question about how you work within existing systems because that's very much what Black Mountains College was set up for. Um, but yes, the the incredible response and, and media we've had lately, I think, is testament to the fact that uh, many educators are hungry for uh, alternative ways of doing things. Um, uh, over the last two weeks, we've had 150 CVs of people who want to work for us, and that that we've only got 20 slots for for students, let alone on our undergraduate program. Um, but there's widespread dissatisfaction. Um, in the mainstream um, and so I think that echoes Satish's diagnosis which is you know has been current for a, a long time um, that the mainstream is not delivering so what the alternative looks like in practice for us I think is uh, two key points it's it's what you teach and it's how you teach um, and the what is is really I think not rocket science at all. There's a rich tradition of progressive education, which Schumacher has been at the forefront of, and even Dartington before has pioneered for a hundred years. Um, <clears throat> and John Dewey's uh, basic outlook has been um, the same and has, has, has stood the test of time that education is not preparation for life. Education is life. Um, so the, the what is, I think, broadly, a kind of critical perspective on on where we are. The the problem with why that I think is is at the moment is proving so popular with educators and with students, but also so difficult for the mainstream, is that the mainstream has become increasingly narrow and is actually increasingly further and further from the original animating principles um, of education. What is school for? Um, why are we here? Um, and to give you an example of that, um, the number one priority on the DFE, the Department for Education website in England, um, in terms of their strategic outcomes, number one is drive economic growth through improving the skills pipeline. So that's not even about jobs. That's not even about the well-being of individuals. So that gives you a measure of kind of how far we are. Uh, we're off the pace. Um, so that's the, the the other points about the what are again the kind of I think well-worn um, truths of prog the progressive agenda, which is interdisciplinarity, um, which is putting ecology at the heart of of literacy. It's not just maths and English, but actually you need to know. A little bit about your own habitat um, and I think the third element which which we've uh, um, woven into all our work is actually being explicitly political um, and that's because we have to acknowledge that you know modernity in our civilization is founded on uh, a long history of violence and extraction so if we are going to think imaginatively and critically about alternative ways of doing things, we have to actually reckon with the, you know, the fundamental contradictions of, of where we are and how we got here. Um, and that, of course, is, is much harder in the national curriculum, which we need to be always remember was brought in by Margaret Thatcher in order to curb the independence and imagination of individual teachers. Um, so, but in FE and HE, we have a different opportunity so the how um, is really about um, 
breaking up, I think, some of the some of the habits and the culture. And it's not necessarily always mandated. It's obviously harder in uh, in state state funded schools. But um, there's nothing stopping us getting outside, having experiences, having um, uh, different alternative um, learning environments, learning through questions, learning through applied problems with social outcomes, um, all of which uh, in, usually end up with with you know much more holistic and uh, and harmonious solutions. So that the the how side of things is is also quite challenging because it involves students unlearning what they think is learning. Um, so we've had you know students and teachers sort of asking to. Um, to get back in the classroom sometimes when they feel a bit lost and unstructured um, but what we've had to do actually is to encourage people to stick with the process because often you have an experience which is generative but you might not recognize it as such until the next day or indeed the next year um, and you might think you've just gone for a walk in the woods but actually you've you've taken something away and it's not always uh, you know uh, clearly obvious so the rational um sort of state-sponsored econometric approach everything must be measured um everything must be demonstrated and justified so we do need a little bit more space for experience um and for for generative dialogue um the last thing to say is, is about the the kind of how of the you know how is that operationalized um and here i think there are barriers to regulation but there are all, there are regulatory barriers, but there are also imaginative barriers. So, within further education, for example, you have a core skills requirement um, at every level, and we've taken that core skills requirement and we've reimagined it and said, well, what are the core skills for the twenty first century? Um, so instead of doing maths and English and literacy and and CV writing, we do climate literacy, ecology, communication, collaboration, empathy, um, the, the key literacies that we think are important. So that space is actually there within the existing FE structure. And at higher education, we've had a spectacular partner in uh, Cardiff Metropolitan University, who over the course of three years, and it's taken quite a lot of time, but we navigated with them through their degree accreditation process um, to come up with, for example, creative solutions to assessment, to how you um, accumulate various credit points across a degree program, how we split um, the all of the various uh, HECAS codes that th this will be familiar to university lecturers watching, but um, to, to add up the various points that an interdisciplinary degree uh, requires to give us space to innovate. So it, it, it is possible, it takes work, you need um, committed people, um, but I think the, the overarching sort of regulatory framework of most higher education is not set up to support that kind of innovation and that kind of creativity within their validation structures. The reason why it's important that we, that we do that work within uh, existing regulatory frameworks is because we have to blaze a trail for others. We have to show how it's possible because we can't all go to Steiner schools or indeed private education. Um, and, and we have to be working as Rachel is, is, is in uh, primary and secondary schools to show universities that there is another way. Um, and I must say the, the students um, and employers um, <clears throat> and teachers are valuing that um, and we're finding you know that we're, we're kind of overwhelmed at the moment with uh, responding to people who are who are really interested so we're, we're not actually just teaching the people that we've got here but we're finding ourselves um, being asked to, um, to 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 speak to lead to you know in, in a way to to try and help others um, on that journey and that's great um, but that's that's a sort of reinforcement, really, of of a the 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 kind of widespread demand, but b the need to um, to take the system on, um, if you like. So let me stop there. Great, thank you, Ben. Um, and actually, you did a great job as well because unknowingly you answered one of the questions someone had asked in the chat um, preemptively, which was about how are we shifting assessment models. Um, I'd love 
in a minute um, to bring in Satish and Rachel to have a bit more of a discussion and perhaps pose that question um, that I think you brought up, Ben, which is like you've obviously found a space, a chink, if you like, um, in, the, in the existing um, structure that you were able to reimagine, you know, you were able to reimagine within the current bounds of what um, further education sets out. Um, reimagine what you were assessing against and I'd love to know um, from Satish and Rachel in a minute you know where are you also seeing chinks where you feel like you know it's well within our gift already to be shifting how the system works um, before I do that then maybe just one last thing I'd love to pick up on because I can see the Welsh in the uh, on the sign in the background is I was also intrigued by how Black Mountains College is almost a reflection of the place that it's in as well that you've actually rethought what a you know university or a sort of university setting looks like um, I don't know if you want to say anything on that and what it means to be in the place that you're in as opposed to any university. Well, there's I think there's two points. Um, uh, the first is Black Mountains was very much inspired by Black Mountain in North Carolina in America, which was a, a real pioneer in terms of um, regenerative education and uh, kind of resistance to fascism. Um, and the second is that that Wales itself is a fantastic um, crucible, but also um, sort of platform for new models of education for two reasons. It's got the Donaldson curriculum, which is um, a, a fantastic reimagining of the national curriculum in Wales, which puts uh, sustainability and creativity at the heart of um, an interdisciplinary curriculum for secondary schools. Um, and the second is the Future Generations Act, which the Welsh government brought in in 2015, which mandates um, long-term thinking, intergenerational solutions, um, all sorts of other uh, well-being indicators for all public expenditure, and that includes mm -hmm. schools um, and universities. So we have both the permission but also the support, the statutory support from the Welsh Government, um, which underpins a lot of what we do. And in fact, um, all of our third year practical applied models are mapped to the Future Generations Act. So with our students in the undergraduate programme, then we'll go on to do real world projects, which are all geared to making the Future Generations Act a reality. That's great. Thank you, Ben. Um, all right. So maybe if I bring in three of you now so we can have a bit of a discussion about this. And I'd love just to pose that question I said before, which is like what already feels like within our gift to change in the current policy environment? Um, perhaps not as great in the rest of, well, in England versus Wales. I don't know, Rachel, hmm. perhaps you can pick us off. No, it, Wales is the mecca for, for kind of or the horizon that we're all sort of looking towards at the moment. Um, uh, that word permission, Ben, is such a, an important word, and I talk a lot about permission to rebel, which perhaps sounds a little bit too anarchic for, for a Tuesday evening, but there's also the, the recognition of what, what do we need to start giving ourselves permission to, to shift? And there are three um, three elements in, in, in education, mainstream education, that have come about because they're addressing symptoms. So most schools, or all schools now have to have a mental health and well-being lead. Uh, because they also have to have a mental health and well-being policy. They have to have a, a quality, diversity and inclusion policy and a, a lead and also a sustainability and climate and sustainability policy and lead. Now, this might seem um, perfunctory because these are add on policies as opposed to uh, foundational cultures. But what it means is that schools have to give priority to those three elements of education. Um, and so there's a little bit of, of, of work that goes on with playing the game to change the rules. We know that mental health, social justice and the climate and nature crisis are key elements that we're being asked to address from the side in the education system. So what happens if we actually put them as a foundation? So firstly, that invitation to sort of work with policy. Secondly, um, there are, there's been quite a significant number of leading reports over the last three years from UNESCO and the UN from the OECD, uh, excuse me, from the Times Education Commission just last year, looking at the state of our current education systems. And they're damning um, from every angle. And they're, they're showing time and again that the education system is, is not fit for purpose and needs to reform and regenerate. And there are 12 step um, pointers in the Times Education Commission that was actually written by three former education ministers, former prime ministers, head teachers, so the, the, those of us inside the system are also giving permission for the system to transform itself. Um, so I think I'm, I'm really interested in how we can elevate 
that confidence from teachers, head teachers, to look out and, and almost kind of jump into lifeboats and, and zoom off whilst the Titanic itself is starting to, to shift. Um, but actually by playing the game a little bit, by thinking of what policy do we have to start focusing on and how can we really put that at the foundation of, of school? It might feel a little bit perfunctory in this space, but actually it just starts to shift the dynamic when, when priority is given um, to caring for self, other and nature in, in that particular way. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and maybe Satish, I mean, I guess I, I'm sensing, I'm reading a few of the different questions coming up in the Q&A box around this, uh, and a lot coming in there about vested interests and, you know, uh, and is, I guess, I think asking the question of, are schools and education settings really going to be the place that drives the change, or will the change actually need to come from somewhere else? Uh, and I don't know with your perspective over a long period uh, where you're seeing change happen. Um. Each and every one of us have to be uh, the catalyst of change. Change is not going to come from the top. Change is not going to come from 10 Downing Street. Change is not going to come from the White House or the Kremlin. It's going to come from the people at the grassroots level. Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, they did not come from the top. They came from the grassroots level. And what we need that change is each and every one of us have to become activists and say, we are going to be the catalysts and agents of change. That's a first uh, um, uh, uh, principle. Secondly, I would like to say that the, we have to change the idea that nature and humans are separate. Nature out there, the mountains and the forests and the rivers and the animals are nature, and we humans are not nature. So that has to change. And I think we have to say that humans are as much nature as mountains and forests and animals and rivers. We are nature. And what we do to nature, we do to ourselves. We have to think that. that what we do to nature, if we pollute the water, we have to drink it. If we pollute the air, we have to breathe it. If we change the climate, we have to live in it. So what we do to nature, we do to ourselves. So that change of consciousness, change of understanding, change of worldview, that we are nature and what we do nature, we are doing to ourselves. And by doing that, we should say that we have to learn from nature. Our educated people, they may be BA, MA, PhD, but they are ecologically illiterate. Most of our educated people are totally illiterate ecologically. So we need to bring eco-literacy and we have to know nature, the mountains, the forests and the rivers and how they function, how they work. So nature has to be our teacher and we have to re respect nature. At the moment, we see, just exploit nature, do what you like to nature. We think that human beings are somehow superior to nature. We are above nature and we have some kind of like a, a human imperialism or human colonialism. We can rule over nature. We can do to nature what we like. This is the change that I want to see. And Schumacher College is pioneering that and, uh, and Black Mountain College is pioneering that. That we are nature and we have to learn about nature and we have to be um, uh, uh, kind of uh, be, be nature and live in harmony with nature. So that change will not going to come from 10 Downing Street. They are wedded to economic growth, economic growth, economic growth. America, richest country in the world, and yet they don't have enough. They want more economic growth. Britain, fourth or fifth economy or sixth economy in the world, and still we are economic growth, economic growth, nothing else important. Economic growth is the aim. Humans are just fodder for economic growth. Nature, fodder for economic growth. So I'm passionate about conserving, protecting, revering nature. That's the real change that I want to see in the world. Thank you, Satish. And maybe a follow-up, actually. I mean, I'd also be interested for Rachel and Ben's thoughts on this, but it's come up in a couple of questions. It's almost how do we shift our mentality about lifelong learning? And, you know, that, you know, learning doesn't stop, start and stop when we go to school. How do we change the mindset of adults as well who aren't part of kind of our classical education systems anymore? You are never too old to learn. I'm 86 years old. And when I teach at Schumacher College, I say to my young students, you are my teacher. I'm learning from you. So you are never too old to learn. And all our older generation uh, who are rulers 
and industrialists and business leaders, they have to become pupils and they have to learn about nature, from nature and about future generations. And, and, and Ben talked about future generations, the act about intergenerational um, kind of uh, future. That is wonderful. So we all have to be humble. At the moment, humanity is lacking humility. And without humility, there is no humanity. So we have to become humble and be lifelong learners and learn from nature and learn from elders and learn from young people. And there's, yeah. there's something as well right. with, sorry, sorry, there's something as well that um, Ben was talking about earlier about we need to really shift the mindset on what education is away from outcome into process. It's the how that which is as, as valuable as the what. And right now we've got models that celebrate the outcome um, of education with a finality as opposed to the process. And so a lot of that lifelong learning is recognizing, as Satish so beautifully said, that we don't stop learning at a particular age. You don't become you know, in, wise uh, at 18, when you've filled your head with as much as you can get and leave school and you, you've, you've finished learning. Um, and and there's, a, there's a, an invitation, I think, um, for all of us to actually recognize that, that humility, again, as Satish was saying. But also, I talk a lot about, you know, the, the three wisest teachers that we have. One of them is, is nature. It's teaching constantly for us to know who we are, know where we're going, and, and to unlearn so much of what has got in the way of us of us being um, much more connected. The second teacher is children. Children have so much to teach us about what life is all around, about, and yet we try and teach them how to live life. And there's, a, there's an irony in that. And so let us learn from children and in their innate ways of being curious, compassionate, conscious, um, and connected. And finally, the gut. Uh, our gut instinct is incredibly wise. And right now, in many of us, it's saying, you know, this is not right. This way of living is fundamentally making us all ill. And so I really sort of channel that inner, inner wisdom. You know, we lived as humans for 95% of our evolution with an ecological mindset, living in balance with ourselves and the planet. And it's only in very recent human history that we've tipped the scales into this very extractive, reductive, consumptive mindset. And so it's, a, it's something in us, it's in our DNA to actually be living in this ecological way. So, so welcoming in that humility to recognize that we need to unlearn and that grace to actually look at what learning we can gain from, from those sort of wisdom keepers. And, and I think if, if, I, if it's my turn, but I, I can, I, can I, th I think there's a chink there. We, um, you started, uh, Roberta, with the question about chinks. I mean, there is an enormous demand now um, for learning, precisely because everybody's realizing um, way too late that we're in a mess and we need to be doing things differently. So the, we, I don't, we can't force people to do lifelong learning, but I think what we can do is capitalize on um, an incredible amount of demand now for climate literacy, eco literacy, systems change, um, and the, we do that through uh, radical adaptation short courses. Um, there are all sorts of other uh, other courses out there which are experiencing a huge boom in subscription, and I think that's also where the chink is in. Uh, moving um, existing tertiary education, so further education and higher education, these are, yes, vested interest, big corporations with a lot of money at stake and finance capital and all the rest of it, but they are fundamentally now more and more consumer-driven organisations. So you have the NUS and the student bodies who have a, a big voice, who can drive change, who, for example, went on strike at the University of Barcelona until the university agreed to teach climate literacy to all undergraduates. Um, and we're seeing some of those moves um, here in the UK as well. So I think where we can look for, we can look to, to the demand. We can also look to the autonomy of individual academics within their programs, who, for example, could teach degrowth uh, economics in their economics classes, um, who can also find community elsewhere. There are many uh, networks now so popping up, things like Faculty for the Future, um, and also internationally. So we're, or you know, we haven't started teaching our undergraduate degree here, but we are, people are asking us for um, to copy the model. <clears throat> 
in in Australia, in Panama, in South Africa. In, you know, there's a a bunch of conversations where actually there are other universities, there are people who are seeing this as possibility, uh, as a possibility. So, um, I think that the 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 question we always pose at the end of our radical adaptation course is where do you see yourself in this arc of of change and disruption you have a role to play and it might be just within your classroom it might be within your school it might be with other people within your union or indeed internationally <laughs> but there is a community there of people who share your values it's just a question of finding them um, and working with them yeah thank you ben and maybe actually you touched on radical adaptation and that was actually related to one of the questions coming up um, from the audience as well which is sort of at this point how much is it about actually learning I think it was phrased as learning to collapse well you know how much is this about coping with what's coming and how much is it shaping a different future in your view absolutely um absolutely we we, we always needed to do to do this better um in in the way that um you know Satish has outlined for for several decades but um it's much more important now <laughs> it's much more relevant now um and and the mainstream is catching up which means that there's an opportunity to do it at scale um but yes there is an awful lot of of, of grief and letting go as well in terms of what we uh, as soon as you put that ecological lens on and you start to see the reality um you realize uh the level of change that, that's happening, the level of change we have to cope with. Um, and actually, I've started making the, the argument, this is, this is not about elective environmentalism, this is about national security. This is about how are we going to feed um, 9 billion people on a planet with a carrying capacity you know, of 4 or 5 billion or less. Um, uh, so this, and within a very short period of time, within my lifetime. So, the, the, you know, the, those are the bigger questions, um, which which what which is what regenerative education um, gives us at least a, a roadmap um, and, a, and a set of questions, um, whereas your your average subject focused uh, lesson um, do, doesn't, you know, doesn't even scratch the surface. Mm. There's, there's something as well in the oh, sorry, Satish. No, Rachel, you go. Okay, very quickly, I was just going to say there's something as well in the energy of radical adaptation, but we can hark back to COVID and to the to the pandemic. Um, we've had this illusion in, in recent history that human beings are dominant and we're in control. And the pandemic very quickly showed us that it, that is not true in any sense. And that no notion that we had in the pandemic of um, understanding that the world is volatile, it's complex, um, it's very uncertain and we need to be um, both humble and adaptive to what is coming. These shockwaves will keep coming. And so I think there's something as well about let's let's um, remind ourselves of what we've all collectively experienced, because when we when we understand something from a felt experience, it feels a lot more um, welcome is perhaps the wrong word. You know, I speak to a lot of teachers about the idea of adaptation, and that just feels like a, a terrifying idea because we're not talking about resilience for the long term. We're talking about resilience as a buzzword. And yet we know that we need to be really completely shifting our mindsets, our behavior patterns. As Ben said, we, we, we've got huge calamities coming that we can't just stick our fingers in our ears and ignore. But also, how can we support those who are, I think, in a, in a state of shock? There's millions in a state of shock right now because um, this 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 news is suddenly kind of coming as a as a little bit of a surprise, which um, we can talk about that in another in another um, podcast. Um, so I think there's something about that that welcoming the fact that we did adapt very quickly during lockdown. Not not particularly cheery things to adapt to, but we can if we have the collective will shift our behaviors incredibly quickly. So building on the energy of what is possible um, so that we can allow the space um, moving forward. Thank you, Satish. No, no I, I would just wanted to make a practical suggestion. <clears throat> Every school should be connected and associated with a farm. Every university and every school should have a garden so the children can see the miracle of nature how you plant one tiny seed of tomato in the soil and that tiny seed, almost invisible seed, can become a plant and give 100 tomatoes with hundreds of seeds in it. That miracle of nature has to be experienced by our young students. So every school should have a garden. Every school should be associated with a farm. Every university 
should have a garden and a farm so that our young people are not just sitting in front of a computer or in, even in a library or just uh, in your classroom. As Rachel said, we don't go out in nature. So our young people, professors, lecturers, chancellors, vice chancellors, students, they should all go and work on the farm and, and experience nature in the forest and, and experience animals because we are nature. And when we are disconnected from nature, we suffer mentally, physically, economically, environmentally, and in every other way. So I would say practical suggestion that every school and university should have a garden where our children work and they should be associated with the farms and we should go out classroom, outdoor classroom, rather than an indoor classroom, maybe three days in, indoor and two days outdoor classroom. That way we can transform education. That's my practical suggestion. Maybe RSA can take up this course and make every school and every university persuade them, that we can't, info, and can't force it, but persuade them the value of being outdoor in nature, understanding environment, learning from nature and being nature rather than just controlling nature. Oh, Satish, yes. And, and I mean, um, I'm reminded of, is it Christopher Alexander, who really described almost what, what it's like to put schools back in the centre of communities as well. You know, this is, we, we sort of separate out school and education as though it's something that happens in a bubble elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> sort of how we exactly. get it back in the yes. centre. Yes. Uh, I mean, yes, Mr. Alexander, I had a privilege of meeting him because he was our teacher at Schumacher College. So, so he, he was a great architect and great environmentalist and great spiritual being. He passed away, uh, but we miss him. Thank you for mentioning his name. Yeah, well, thank you. And I, I suppose I'm reminded, you know, and I, I wonder if a few people are feeling like this in the audience. You know, when you speak, when each of you speak, actually, um, it's very easy to feel like this is dead obvious <laughs> you know we it's kind of it's on one level easy I wouldn't call it easy but you know we, we sort of know what some of the solutions are um but I know you know a few people have said in, in uh, made a few comments in, in the Q&A box things like you know actually for example any kind of um anti-growth anti-capitalist agenda you almost gets badged straight as a prevention case in schools or you know and I'm not necessarily saying that's the route but there, there's lots of resistance built in the system and I'm wondering um, for the group here, you know, where are you seeing the key points of resistance to this kind of change? What do you think we really need to unlock if we're going to make progress? Um, uh, I yeah, start? So please do. I, I would like to say that we make progress not by being anti-growth, but by being pro-well-being. At the moment, economic growth for the sake of economic growth. It is not focusing on the well-being of humans and well-being of planet. So I, rather than being negative about anti-growth or even degrowth, I mean, Ben mentioned degrowth, which is interesting idea, but I would like to have a more positive uh, view. How can we shift our focus from economic growth to growth in well-being of humans and well-being of the planet. If the economy and economic growth does not lead to mental well-being, physical well-being, social well-being, all those well-being, human well-being, and we have economic growth, more cars, more airports, more roads, more infrastructure, more industry, more everything, and no human being well-being. What's the point of all that economic growth? So why do we have economic growth? So I'm not anti-growth per se. I'm saying that growth, natural growth, trees grow, but there's a human scale and then they stop. Growth in its own way could be good if it is leading to well-being. So let's change our focus from economic growth to growth in well-being of humans, well-being of planet, well-being of rivers and oceans and forests and climate. That is my uh, focus and more positive rather than being anti-growth or degrowth. Although Ben mentioned degrowth, uh, I don't want to oppose it, but I have my feeling that we should be more positive. Mm. And I'll echo that, Satish, again. It's something about the, 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 the focus of what if, 
as opposed to putting all our attention on what's broken, let's look at what is possible. And, and, and we use yeah. triple well-being at Thoughtbox, this idea of personal, social and ecological well-being being bound up in one. So what, what does it look like for a school to have triple well-being as a foundational mindset? And let's grow from there. And I've just had a, a sort of thought about that beautiful um, video you may have seen about wolves being reintroduced into Yellowstone National Park. So we had a point of intervention within Yellowstone National Park where wolves are reintroduced and the entire ecosystem regenerated and flourished because of that shift of, of, of something coming in. Um, and so what can we do to shift um, a mindset in education that actually will naturally regenerate itself? And I think there's such a lot of power in the positive. Um, and we use a lot of Joanna Macy's work at Thoughtbox to really focus on the, the story of the great turning, the story of all the, all the people out there making a difference and what education can be like if we feel brave and bold enough. Otherwise, we just get sucked down into the quagmire of complexity of what isn't possible. And so much is possible, as Satisha said as well, and Ben has echoed, by us um, being that change in the way that mm. our mindsets are sort of shifting as well. That leads nicely to, to my final point, which was going to be about sort of zooming out and seeing the big the big picture and seeing ourselves as all part of a social movement so the the common enemy here is is economic growth and vested interest and um a very conservative government with um a stranglehold on on education policy um and if we if we think about how you know it's the same across many other sectors but how do you unlock how do you change um those mindsets, how do you shift to uh, a, a more regenerative economy and culture more broadly? Um, and that question is, is one about of social movement. And we are all here collectively um, iterating and demonstrating examples of ways to do things differently. Um, and hopefully over time that momentum grows um, and as individuals, we all need to be looking for those relationships that we can build so that um, and to try and uh, if you do feel alone try and overcome that feeling of of being the lone voice in an institution or a community or a family or an organization and finding other people who share your uh, share your values and then building that momentum and saying well what can we do what can we do here what can we do there who can i join with and that's how you build um the social movement and it does have a political sharp end um in terms of hopefully uh, uh, another government and another uh, education secretary that's more that's more receptive but it might well take um a cultural shift within uh, education more broadly before we before we get to that point but um just to see all of ourselves as uh, you know a, a, as part of a wider movement i think that is mm. i love it um, thank you, Ben. Um, Satish, Rachel, we're nearly at time. I, I'm wondering if there's any last key points you wanted to make sure you'd said before we close off. Um, key point is that uh, I've said already, but all of us who are listening to this debate, we all become activists. We take part, responsibility. Don't wait for somebody else to change. We have to take responsibility. Be, we have to start with ourselves. I think be the change that you want to see in the world, as Mahatma Gandhi said, and then communicate that change. And as we are doing now, communication is very important. We have to spread the word and, and talk to other people. Be the change, communicate the change. And then as Ben said, organize the change. Any great movement starts with many, many small um, uh, people, small organizations, small groups joining together working together like a great river is made of many, many small tributaries. So the great movement of transformation will start from many, many individuals and groups coming together. So be the change, communicate the change and organize the change and change will come. Thank you. Be the river. Uh, Rachel? I just jump on the back of that one. I was sort of just going to invite the question of which story are you part of? And which story do you want to be telling? Um, and that, that recognition that all systems around us are just stories that a lot of people believe in. So we can actually believe in different stories and we can change the system in that way. So really allow that notion of, of just change the story and you change the, uh, the world around you. Thank you. 
brilliant thoughts to end on. Um, I, we've run out of time. I knew this would happen, but thank you so much. There have been so many comments and questions coming through. So thank you to everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't get to them all in this discussion now. But this is a topic we'll be working on uh, into the future. So please consider joining other conversations we'll have in the same vein. Uh, have a look at the capabilities inquiry work we're doing on our website. Um, if you're a fellow, you can join the conversation on Circle 2. And hopefully you've caught loads of the different resources of our speakers um, on the chat as we've gone through as well. Um, but for now, uh, I think that all that's left is to kind of say a big thank you. Uh, Rachel's joining us on her birthday. So happy birthday, Rachel. Thank you so much <laughs> for your you. dedication to this movement. Pleasure. <laughs> for speaking to us in your evening tonight. Um, and thank you, Satish and Ben. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, thank you all for watching. And hopefully we'll continue the conversation soon. So good night. Or good rest of your day, wherever you are. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.